Well, we've been working our way through several texts. This morning we have three readings. If you keep up with the lectionary, you'll know there are four readings, but we seldomly do all four. This morning we picked up the three uh, because as I was reading the Genesis passage, I saw some interesting ties to the Romans passage. Now, if you remember, I've spoken about Paul had some questions on his mind that he was answering for us that are not particularly modern questions, uh, but they would be questions that he had. One is, uh, if the law is good, uh, then why did we need Jesus? Which is, I talked about, right, the law is good, the law is not so good. Uh, There's a couple of other questions that are on his mind as well. Uh, One is, uh, having to do with, uh, is there any advantage to being born Jewish? Uh, If you can be Gentile and come right on into the kingdom of God, are there advantages to being born Jewish? And Paul will go, of course there are, uh, but we're not looking at those questions today. Uh, There are issues having to do with people hearing the gospel and not listening to it. Uh, We pick that up as well from Jesus today. And like I said, there are are certain questions that Paul has that we don't really relate to as well. We'll be looking at some of those this morning. Uh, One of the fascinating parts, though, about the passage today in Romans is the question between this battle that goes on internally, uh, the battle inside of us between the flesh and between the spirit. Paul talks about this fleshly battle and this spiritly battle. Uh, You can learn the two Greek words very easily for these two. The flesh being sarka. Now you're thinking, why in the world would I remember sarka? If you can remember sarcasm, uh, which is one of my favorite means of communication, right? Sarcasm. Uh, Sarka means flesh. Chasm is a ripping Uh, You know, a chasm being something wide. So if you can remember the ripping of flesh is what sarcasm is. You can remember sarca. Uh, Pneuma would be uh, pneumatic tools, air, so that's the spirit. So we have this battle going on inside of us. The Genesis passage has something interesting that I hadn't noticed before. In in the birth of Jacob, uh, we have Rebecca talking about the twins being inside her battling. I begin to think about the twins not just being two nations, but from our birth, we appear to have a battle going on inside of each of us, a battle between the good and the evil. So let's look at the text. We'll go ahead and open those and open right to them this morning. The Genesis passage is the 25th chapter of Genesis, and I'll be picking up at the 19th through the 34th verse. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel and Amram of Padam Amer, sisters of Leban of Amer. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children's struggled together within her. And she said, if it is to be this way, why do I want to live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two people born to you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, and all his body like hair of mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is my birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank and he rose and he went away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. From the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 11. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walks not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit? For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set upon the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who has raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. And from the book of Matthew, uh, this is a story I'm sure you all know quite well, this parable of the sower. The 13th chapter I pick up in the first verse. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Such great crowds gathered around Him that He got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And then He told them things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then later he was with his disciples and he explained the parables, saying, Hear then the parables of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. What is sown in the heart, what is sown on the path. As for what is sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on the account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what is sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares about the world and the lures of wealth choke out the word, and it yields nothing. But as for those who is sown on good soil. This is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind The words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Most of you look old enough to remember the movie The Good, The Bad, and The the Ugly. You guys knew it right off the bat. I didn't have to go anywhere with that. The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Clint Eastwood movies. The Spaghetti Westerns, right? They They were named that because they were made in Italy. Uh, strangely enough. John, and, and as I read these texts, I began to think about this. Inside each of us, we have good and we have bad. Maybe it's just me. The two are warring against each other. You probably don't have these issues, right? Well, I'll go on anyway. Uh, so we, we have battling with this, the good and the bad. I, I couldn't name it the good, the bad, and the ugly because in school where I learned about preaching sermons, you're supposed to land on God, 
Anybody see the problem with naming it ugly? <laughs> Good and the bad, and sometimes we are involved in the ugly, but God is not. God is the beautiful. So, I, you know, I want to talk a little bit about human nature here. Because human nature is something we're always curious about, and we, we have different ways of trying to explain human nature. You know, do we contain uh, good? Do we contain bad? What, what is the issue that's going on here? Well, if you look at the Genesis passage, and some preachers do this, they'll interpret the Scripture to say this, that there's some groups of people that are wholly so bad that we should just kill them all off. Uh, have, have you heard this ever taught before? That there are groups of people that are so bad that what we should do is just go ahead and do genocide. Now, that's been preached sometimes in history. It's been used, uh, Hitler, Pol Pot, we've had different people. And if you're going to do that, the first thing you need to do is you need to dehumanize the people. Uh, then you need to create a subhuman group that you call them. And once you make them subhuman, then you're able to kill them off. In, in case you were wondering what the pattern is sociologically, how to get rid of a group of people. Uh, the problem with doing that does, is, is, does anybody have any issues with what the problem is? Uh, who becomes the bad group when you set about doing that? Uh, you, you don't stay very clean, do you? Uh, when you decide to go ahead and do genocide, what, what happens to us? We, look, I'm going to start with, I'm going to assume that we're the good group in the room, okay? Right? Do you want to assume that you're the bad group? Or, no, no, let's start with the good group. So if we're the good group and then we decide to kill off the other group, we become the bad group. Do you, you follow me immediately? So we're just going to throw that whole premise right out, that there are good groups of people and bad groups of people. Uh, what we found monotonously throughout humanity, if you study sociology, is that most of the morals that we have across cultures are very similar. We have prohibitions against murder. Uh, we, we have certain standards of right and wrong. It's, it's pretty obnoxiously similar but across all of cultures. So what, what we've found often when we run across our enemy is we have met our enemy and they are us. God, y'all, you're good, good. Y'all know this stuff. Uh, so I, this shouldn't be a surprise that all people contain both what I would call good and bad tendencies uh, or what we would call the duality of humans. Uh, have you heard it taught about duality? Uh, we each contain the ability to do really good things and we each contain the ability to do really horrible things. Uh, we, we've seen that consistently throughout humans. And, and it's taught often that we live in this duality. Uh, one of the books that are written about this, you may not be aware that this was the point of this book, uh, was the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. If you read this or seen the movie, uh, the whole idea behind this is, is Dr. Jekyll, what's he going to do? He's going to take some medication, and the medication is going to throw evil out of him so he can do nothing but good. And what happens is we end up with a split personality. Uh, his argument is this, is that as human, part of being human is having both good and evil within each of us, and you can't exclude one without the other. So we're just caught in this place of having both within us. Uh, I would suggest we need to reject this as a, as a standard, although it's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, one of the other ideas of human culture, humans as having good and bad both in us, I saw proposed in, a, in another movie the other night, uh, The Day the World Stood Still. I don't know if you've seen that one. Uh, the idea behind that is, is that we don't change, we don't leave behind evil and bad until we're faced with our own destruction. That is, finally, when faced with destruction, we finally change. I would suggest that even facing destruction, we don't always change. What did the medical research say? That less than 30% of people who have heart disease will change their diet? So even facing destruction, that doesn't always get us to change. We're somewhat set in our ways. Uh, as you look at all these different standards, there, there's another proposal as to human nature. I kind of like this one a little bit better. It fits my theology. Uh, it's from Scott Peck. And you can read the book called People of the Lie. And it talks about the problem of evil in the world uh, and, and people taking evil in and living it out. It proposes simply this, that the number one evil, the first one, the first lie we tell is that we ourselves are God. Uh, it's in Genesis, right? I always go back to this. Eat of this fruit, you can be like God. You can be your own independent moral agents. You're on your own, you're good. The problem is, is then you have to tell a whole series of other lies to maintain the big lie. Because I got news for you, you're not God. 
Well, nobody got up and walked out. Right? I always say this about it. There's only room enough for one God in the room. You've known people like that, haven't you? There's a few people connecting the dots. These are the jokes. <laughs> Sometimes my Deb, my Deb tells me I need to tell people that they're jokes because they don't know I'm kidding. Sometimes because they don't know the joke. So, you know, I mean, there's only enough room for one God in the room. And if we believe that we're God, all the other sin, all the other lies are all to maintain this first one. That's what Scott Peck says. And so what ends up happening is, is we have this moral spiral that we get painted further and further into a corner, uh, that we get caught up in more and more evil. But I, I find for the most part, most people are somewhere in what Paul is describing. And, and I like Paul's explanation here. What's really going on? What's the real problem? Uh, Paul puts it this way. He says, the problem is, is you don't know that you're hopeless. Kind of harsh, isn't it? You, you don't know that you're in a hopeless condition. That is, you don't know that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Uh, how many of these of us? All. I'm going to go without even looking it up in the Greek. By all, he means everybody. It's all of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned in our life. None of us have met the standard. And so in the means of coming to God, we have all come short. And so Paul says that you are, and I'll put it this way, you're as bad off as you could be. If you're a study of theologians, if you're a study of theology, one of the things you'll, you'll hear is in Calvinism, what they'll propose is that you are um, completely deprived, uh, you're completely depraved as a fallen sinner. That is, you are as bad as you can be. Uh, I don't particularly hold to that standard. I would say you are as bad off as you could be. Uh, there's a slight difference there. Uh, that is, you have the capability of doing good, but in all the good you do, it doesn't do enough good. Uh, the other would be the standard of you can't even do any good in your fallen state. Well, e either one of these puts us both in what? A hopeless situation. And so what does Paul say? He says there's these two things that are warring against each other. They're, they're going against each other and battling. It is our flesh and our spirit. And his cure is really kind of interesting. And if you didn't notice it, it studied there very, in the very beginning. He said the cure for the sin in the flesh is that God Himself came in the flesh. That is, our flesh and our spirit is being redeemed by Christ coming into the world. Uh, the, the redemption is simply that Christ is coming into the world and setting us up to be able to do the battle. He, he said the problem with the law is not simply that you can't live by the law. The law is the standard. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is good. The law is perfect. The problem is you can't do it. And so it only exhibits how far we short, how short we are. But Christ is the solution. So we have this internal battle going on. The battle between the good and, and the evil. The battle between doing right and what's almost right. And Christ is the answer in that. You know, the Jewish people back in the day, they had trouble hearing this message. And one of the reasons is, is we're not completely aware of the assumption that would keep them from coming to it. The assumption was this, was that they were the chosen people, that they had the law, and that they already had salvation. That is, through birthright and through the law, they already had salvation. And so what does Paul come saying? What does Jesus come saying? Is you don't have it, what you have in the law is a measure that shows that you're short. Uh, that probably wouldn't go over really good if you thought you already had salvation, if you thought you were already there. And so there are those who turned away. Paul, Paul did have to answer the question, well, is there any advantage in being born Jewish? Well, yes, of course. Because the law is good, the law is right, and if you live by the law in whatever way you lived by it, you had a better life. Of course that was better. But what is even better than that, and what was unable to be accomplished in the law, is accomplished in Christ. 
God came into the flesh so that we could be redeemed. Well, as we look at these questions, we, we end up in a place. We end up there to where we go, well, back in the day they would wonder if the resurrection has taken place, which it had happened in Christ, why in the world isn't everything fixed? And this is kind of, I'm, I hope you guys are okay today. We're moving large theological blocks around the room. Uh, as one of my professors would say, you're moving big furniture. So if you've been thinking hard, it's okay. But this particular issue, if the resurrection had come, because this was the understanding of the Jewish people, when the resurrection would come, when the kingdom would come, then all of the problems would be fixed. So the question before Paul was this, uh, well, look, if the resurrection has come, if the kingdom is here among us, then why is everything still bad and ugly? You get the question? Uh, if you're presuming that when the Messiah came, the resurrection took place, this is all fixed. They're all going, well, well what gives here? Uh, and Paul explains it in this way, and the easiest way to explain it is what we'd call is the already and the not yet. That is, the salvation has already come, but it is not fully yet all, all, all received. Uh, uh, maybe I could put it this way. If you ever go to a parade, uh, have you all been to a parade? We had one the 4th of July. Uh, when the parade starts going by you, do you have a parade? Yes. Is the parade already completed? No. Uh, the parade is already Yet the parade is not yet complete. Uh, what, he's, what, what he's saying is, is the resurrection has ushered in the beginning of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. It is in the already. Your sins are forgiven. You are there. It is just not all yet fully received and lived out into the world. Uh, the short, long answer of this is, is there good? Yes. Is there evil? Yes. Is the kingdom of God here? Yes. So we live in the midst of the good, the bad, and here's the beautiful part. We, we live in the midst of the world where Christ, the beautiful, has lived and has come. And what does He do? He talks about this. He talks about spreading seeds. He says, you know, some get it. Some get it partially. Some get it fully. And next season, what do we do? We spread seeds again. Any farmer knows this who's worth his salt. Do you farm only one year and quit? How often do you spread seeds? In every season, you spread seeds. You, you see, the beautiful part that, that, that happens when we're invited into the kingdom is we have forgiveness and we have an eternal and an internal battle going on. But we're also invited into the kingdom to spread the seeds of the kingdom. And even in our brokenness, even in the battles that take place inside of us, even the battles that take place around us, we are invited to scatter the seeds of beauty, to scatter the seeds of God's Word. In the middle of the good and the bad, the beautiful has come along. And, and some of us may go, well, God, why don't you just fix it all now? Because if He fixed it all now, there would be those who didn't hear yet. Because it is out of God's mercy, He waits. And we are invited to scatter beautiful seeds. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.